Welcome to City Week, ladies and gentlemen. As we can continue to close out the Black History Month, I want to uh, introduce to some and uh, present to others uh, a, a gentleman I think perhaps doesn't need any introduction, uh, community activist, also working in the school system, Ernest Ward is my guest this afternoon. Ernest, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, Ernest, you know, you and I go way back, uh, yeah. uh, growing up together, uh, and, and we've shared a lot of stories together. Um, but and I know I know you very well. We know each other. But tell tell the, the uh, audience just a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind. Well, I grew up in a small community called Cannonville. Um, <laughs> it's, it's right between West Point and LaGrange. Uh -huh. um, uh, close knit, loving community. Um, where I grew up in a community that we took care of one another. Um, uh -huh. I remember back in the day, not everybody had a phone in their home, so you could go to your neighbor's house to use the phone, right. go to your neighbor's house to borrow a cup of grits, cereal, yeah. uh, eggs, whatever it was. You know, you didn't lock your doors because if your neighbors needed something, they came over and borrowed it, uh -huh. and likewise. Uh -huh. It was just close-knit community. Absolutely. And you, let me ask you, in today's society, do you ever think we can kind of move back towards that at some point, Ernest? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I don't think so. Not realistically, right? <laughs> Would no, be nice, huh? Would be I, nice. I, I don't think so. That's Say not wishful giving, thinking. Not, not giving people access to f people didn't Free steal women. back then. That's right. That's right. You know, they were trustworthy. They right? were very trustworthy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that that that's been lost. Um, if you can't see them, <laughs> it's almost as if you can't trust them. That's it. And that's sad to say we're there. Yeah. Huh? Um, mm -hmm. But no. Okay. Well, I, and I, just, I already knew the answer, but I do want to ask it. <laughs> Let me ask you, Ernest, we, we are celebrating, we're closing out Black History Month. And, you know, for, for us, Black History is every day. Uh, we have been designated the month of February uh, to really uh, expound on it, to bring it to life more so that it helps uh, to educate to uplift and also to reflect on those pioneers that have gone on before us uh, to pave the way for you and I today. Why is it so important to you that we continue to uh, have Black History Month and the importance of it to you? The reason black history is important to me is because uh, we have to correct the lies. Hmm. Um, you know, there have been lies told about history, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 when you and when you study history, some of the lies were intentional mm -hmm. um, to make it seem as if certain groups had no significant part in the establishment of America, mm -hmm. and 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 that's not true, and 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 with any people group. Um, it's very significant to understand the role you played in the past. Mm -hmm. And when you understand the role that you played in the past, it gives you a, 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 sit, a certain type of ownership in knowing that we did some great things. Mm -hmm. I, I have legacy. That's right. And because I have legacy, I can continue to carry on that legacy. But if you don't think that you brought anything to the table, then it makes you feel like you have no hope, mm -hmm. no significance mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, black history is a way of, 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 of writing the ship <laughs> that been set sail in the wrong direction for too long mm -hmm. um, to where everybody, the black race, the white race, we all believe that certain groups were not significant mm -hmm. in the establishment of America. That's right. It's so well, you know, said, Ernest, to correct those incorrect, those lies, as you said, because it's so important that we realize, as you stated, you know, we have contributed a lot to the establishment of the, these United States of America. Yeah, yes. uh, and, and in talking about that, one of the things that I know that we're so fortunate to live in a community where we have individuals in leadership positions that realize that, that not only realize that, but they've taken steps to 
correct certain things that have happened here in this community. Uh, and out of that, one of the things that were, were birthed out of that was the racial trust building. Talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind, Ernest. I, I, I get excited when I talk about the, the racial trust building mm -hmm. um, for many reasons. Uh, one, because it, it, it gives hope uh, to, <clears throat> to those who don't have hope. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then personally, you know, I think back to, I've, from the time I was in middle school, uh, every church that I attended um, was an interracial church, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's what we called it, you know. Mm -hmm. But now, as I think back, it, some of them weren't interracial churches. You know, mm -hmm. they were white churches with black members, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because for a church to be truly interracial, then we should see all races all throughout the church, not just as members, mm -hmm. but as deacons in leadership, as pastors. Mm -hmm. But but that wasn't the case. Uh. Usually you had them as members only, mm -hmm. none as deacons, none mm. in leadership. Okay. And so to me, that's uh, until you learn a person and, 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 and get to know them, mm -hmm. uh, you don't know them. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, and so sometimes we know people from a distance. Uh, what racial trust building did for me for the first time, mm -hmm. I mean, I, 26 years in education, uh, seven years in law enforcement, many years in the military, uh, always interacted with the different cultures and different races. But during racial trust building, it was the first time I had an opportunity to sit down at the table mm -hmm. with white males and have a conversation to where my input mattered. Mm. And isn't that important? And not they had already made a decision before I got there and they just needed me there to rubber stamp mm -hmm. their decisions. Mm -hmm. And here's what's so powerful about the racial trust building process. Um, Sometimes you can start conversations with, with individuals from different cultures, mm -hmm. but when the conversations get heated, usually they have a, they, they they don't come back to the next they meeting. Exit, yeah. They exit right, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. This process hasn't haven't been easy, and the people's a part of this group. We haven't always agreed on everything. Now the one thing that we've agreed upon that we're committed to continue the dialogue no matter how difficult the dialogue becomes. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things about racial trust building is that it requires you to have an honest dialogue, but yet in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that the attacks are not gonna be personal. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that we are able to talk about anything that needs to be uh, spoken of, Mm -hmm. in a safe environment, mm -hmm. but at mm -hmm. the same time, it has to be an honest dialogue. Mm -hmm. We just can't come there and just talk about stuff right. that's not real. <laughs> uh -huh. We have to talk about the real things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and lately, I've been talking a lot about the, uh, the, the, uh, the, not that any individuals today, I don't believe, uh, adhere to white supremacy. Mm -hmm but it was put in place years ago. Mm -hmm. And we haven't done anything to remove those right. principles mm -hmm. and those value systems mm -hmm. uh, that would make those practice uh, what we call systemic racism. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you have to do today, it's just, it carries out by itself. Yeah. Uh, and the American caste system mm -hmm. where the Black 
individuals in, within the culture was at the lowest run. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And everybody else was on top of them. That's right. Um, and th that practice is pretty much still carried out, you know? And, and, and when you go around and you look at individuals in leadership, uh, and we can't tell kids in this community, you can become anything you want to be. Mm -hmm. And they look around and they don't see no one that looks like them in those positions. In leadership position, yeah. Then what are you doing? You just yeah. telling me lies? Yep. Because if, if what you're saying is a reality, mm -hmm. then I should be able to look around and see the fulfillment of what you're saying. Yeah. If I can become anything mm -hmm. that I want to become, well, why didn't the individual before me become anything they wanted to become? Yeah. Uh, and so racial trust building addresses those issues and the need to remove those barriers mm -hmm. that would hinder access to every citizen in the community having a quality of life. And that leads me, and, and you hit all very good points, but I'm, in talking about you know, those hard conversations in safe environments, I want to talk about the apology that took place because I'm sure you know, that was a tough decision to be made, but it was one that was made and I think has made this community stronger. Talk about the importance of the apology that was made by our Chief Dekmar here with, uh, that resulted, you know, the, of the lynching of Callaway here some years ago. Talk about that for us. Well, that, that was very powerful to me mm -hmm. uh, for many reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I practiced the the life of of a Christian, mm -hmm. you know, and and, th and that's what my belief is is that of a Christian, um, and um, because of that, I believe in something called atonement, mm -hmm. you know, um, and to me, that's what that was, mm -hmm. you know, it was an acknowledgement where wrong had taken place. And then not just an acknowledgement, but to correct it and make it right. Mm -hmm. um, it, for me, it exceeded my expectation. Mm -hmm. The apology did, mm -hmm. because not only did the chief apologize, and he didn't do it, uh -huh. but it was his organization right. at the time. Mm -hmm. And, and he had the, the withedness to understand that this incident that occurred is still impacting how people see my organization mm -hmm. that I'm a leader over. Mm -hmm. And even though I wasn't responsible for it, I'm the leader now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to take the necessary actions to correct what the individuals before me did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's tough Powerful. because uh, it made everybody angry. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it made some people from the white culture angry who communicated with me because they were like, man, why y'all stirring up something that happened 40 years ago mm -hmm. uh, when we're over that? We need to just move on. Right. Uh, <laughs> and then some of the people from the black culture said the same thing. Mm -hmm. Why are we stirring up that? Mm -hmm. Man, you know how long ago that happened? Mm -hmm. uh, I said 40, but I think well, 70 years ago. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> why, why are you stirring up something that happened that long ago? Uh, if ain't nobody going to get no money out of it, mm -hmm. why accept the apology? Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of individuals from both sides was not happy not, mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. But for me... I was very happy about it because what it did, it built trust in individuals who was a part of that process and those relationships have, have remained established and it went from the racial trust building, mm -hmm. it turned into troop acts mm -hmm. uh, and from troop acts it turned into the educational task force mm -hmm. and and there are many other things out there that that we as individuals are still working on mm -hmm. and one individual may have the passion for it 
and the whole group come together and work together because we built that trust. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that individual would always come to us wanting a job and, and they had got arrested many mm -hmm. years ago and, and that thing was still showing up on the record and, and we had been trying to work on this thing for some time. Uh, Pam Williams, uh, she was like, Mr. Ward, we need to be able to do something to help these people. And mm -hmm. she called a meeting together and we all came together. And, and when we got there and we talked and I said, we need to get Chief involved in this. Mm -hmm. And we shared it with Chief. The next thing you know, Chief created a record restriction That's right. day. That's right. And so individuals who had did something when they was a teenagers, it'd been 10, 15 years, they hadn't gotten into any more trouble, a record restriction. Mm -hmm. Took that off the record, now the individual can get jobs. Yeah. You know, so when when, when people come together mm -hmm. of like-mindedness, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to agree on everything, but agree on some things right. and begin to work together, it's amazing what we can accomplish. Absolutely. As we get ready to close out, you, you hit on something I want to close out on, and that's about the education. Education is so important, and I know that you... Uh, being a product, as I am, of the Troop County school system. <clears throat> you have children that are in the Troop County school system now. Uh, and we want to close out on a celebratory note, education and how everybody can contribute to the education of our children in the school system, whether they be in our community or they come to visit our community, and that's through SPLOS. I want you to talk a little bit about SPLOS, take about five minutes, talk a little bit about SPLOS, and then talk about the celebratory uh, thing that has happened with your daughter, if you don't mind. Well... The, the SPLOS mm -hmm. is so vital mm -hmm. to this community. Um, and when I look at the facilities that we provided for our communities mm -hmm. and the proposal for what they want to do for the Rosemont community, mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up on well water. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like <laughs> to be on well water. Mm -hmm. And I know what it's like when you go out there and you cut that water on and, and, and no water comes out, you know, yeah. uh, then you have to prime the pump. Mm -hmm. uh, no school system, no facility should be functioning on well water. Mm -hmm. uh, Rosemont deserves the school that they're about to give them. That's why we all need to come together uh, and, and make sure we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What Callaway, that, that, there have been times that... Uh, I've said that the Callaway Zone has always been the redheaded stepchild mm -hmm. of the school system. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't mean that in a negative way, but it was that, you know, uh, LaGrange Zone was taken care of back in the past, always taken care of first, mm -hmm. then Troop, and then maybe Callaway got theirs, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. It's Callaway's time now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time for them to get mm -hmm. what they deserve coming to them. They need an auditorium. Uh, with all the things that, 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 that people do in this day and time within your school, uh, they need that facility. Mm -hmm. uh, LaGrange High has always had a nice auditorium for their students to perform and dance mm -hmm. and their arts. Mm -hmm. uh, Troop has a nice facility to do that. That's right. Uh, we shouldn't limit Callaway uh, because of their location. Right. They need it too. Mm -hmm. We are one county. That's right. Uh, and, and if Every other school has access to those things, then those students need the same access mm -hmm. so that we can, they can reach their full potential. We've, we have produced individuals out of this community who have went on to star in movies and everything else. That's right. The, the, one of the things that we found out through education is looking back, if students who are involved in something, mm -hmm are less likely to drop out of school. That's right, absolutely. That's why we need SPLOS. That's why we need the East SPLOS. Mm -hmm. And when I go around to other counties and, and, and as I follow my kids, uh, we're behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. Go right up the road to Carrollton. They got a multi-purpose facility, mm -hmm. a full length football field in there. Mm -hmm. oh, I go to other places indoor batting facilities that they've had for the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're just getting on board that when they built the school, 
That was part of it. It was a part of the school. Mm -hmm. Not that they built it outside later. Mm -hmm. It was a vision that they had for their kids. And that's where I want us to become mm -hmm. here in Troop County. That when we make decisions, just like the policies say in our board policy, we make all decisions with our students in mind. There we go. And that's what we should do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't think our citizens need to stand in the way of the school board members because you you upset about something that may have happened or you may not have won the election and now it's petty. And so now you want to try to sabotage every single thing that the school system does. Mm -hmm. it, it's time out for that. You you, As my grandmama would say, you don't throw out the baby with the bath water. <laughs> That's right. And so when you try to sabotage the school, you're sabotaging the lives of students. Mm -hmm. And you're throwing out the baby with the mm -hmm. bath water. Absolutely. We can't do that. Yes. Closing on this comment, Haley Ward, I think you have some relationship with her. <laughs> yes, yes. Talk a little bit, take a couple of seconds, just talk about the, the accomplishment that she has made well Haley is just Haley is a dreamer uh -huh. um, if she can think it she will make it happen that's right um, Haley wanted to go to uh, West Point Academy uh -huh. um, and I, I, <laughs> it wasn't my first thing but I've learned you know don't don't get in the way of your kids I'm about to say what you would just say right don't, don't get in the way right. of your kids uh -huh. and, and one of the things um, when I allowed her to go over to the Philippines, mm -hmm. um, that was a hard decision. When she came to me to talk about it, I was like, I didn't even want to talk about it. <laughs> but I couldn't think about sending my baby way over in the Philippines. Something happened, ain't nothing I can do Right, way over there. Mm -hmm. But through all of this process, what it taught me is that I can't allow what were my restrictions Your in boundaries. my box, mm -hmm. in my boundaries, to be my children's boundary, <laughs> because then I won't allow them to reach their full potential. There you go. And so, uh, a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, I we created the right environment for it. But Haley's done a lot of this stuff on her own. Mm -hmm. She applied to go abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, she applied to to West Point Academy. Uh, uh, all of these things that you know, uh, and and I was so excited when uh, Drew Ferguson and and, and some of these individuals wrote her letters or recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, when people come in contact with Haley, they just fall in love with her. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes her personality is so different than her dad, it's sometimes hard to believe that you really, Ernest really your dad. <laughs> I can say, I can say nothing about it. <laughs> it's because our personality is different, there you know you what I'm saying? That's but right. hey, it is what it is. It is what it is. Uh, but I'm excited for Haley uh, because Whatever she dreamed, she accomplished, and she's wanted to be a part of the West Point Academy, and she's accomplished that. Well, very good. And I know that that is a testament to her parents, you and Jennifer as well. And Ernest, I want to thank you because our time is gone, but it was such a great interview, and I want to thank you for coming on and being our guest today. And as we you know, continue to finish or close out, you know, anything that we can do to kind of help continue the racial trust building and the various other things in the community, I definitely want to make sure that you know that we're here as a, a resource in the community as well. So. Well, here, here's, here's what I would say. Um, I wish we as a community, mm -hmm. I, th there, there are individuals that we grew up with from, from different cultures, different races, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know they love us mm -hmm. because we were close. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the thing that I would ask our community to do is to move to a place to where we love one another, our love for one another can extend beyond our race, mm -hmm. our religion, and our political affiliation. Yeah. Now those three other struggles, mm -hmm. when it comes to loving each other, that we hit a brick wall. Yeah. When it comes to race, mm -hmm. when it comes to religion, and when it comes to political uh, affiliation, mm -hmm. we hit a brick wall. And, and, and my daughter, just yesterday, she was having a conversation with me. And, and what she was sharing with me, um, to her, it, it seemed simple. And she said, Dad, you know, I never thought that there were any 
Filipinos in my inner circle. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't know that. She said, but I went to the Philippines for a year. And she said, after being in the Philippines for a year, something happened. After being around that culture for a full year and being around that people group for a full year, once I got back to America, I could look at Filipinos oh. and I knew they were Filipino. Oh, really? And she said, there was a student who I'd known for some time and once mm -hmm. I got back, I said, you're Filipino. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, how do you know that? Because I was born in Hawaii. She said, I just, I've been around you long enough that I know mm -hmm. you when I see you. Ah. That's where I want us to get to mm -hmm. as a people in Troop County. To where we're around each other so much that we know mm -hmm. each other. And we can see beyond race, mm -hmm religion yeah. and political party to where mm -hmm. she say, I, I didn't confuse you as being Reuben. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. I, like people see me and they say, are you Reuben? You know, mm -hmm. you know, you a little joke, all right. black folk look alike. Well, mm -hmm. no, I'm not Reuben, right. but you know, I know Reuben, <laughs> right. but if you get to know me, you never confuse me with Reuben mm -hmm. again. That's right. See, and that's one of the things that my daughter did, and she loved the fact of that experience of being in the Philippines. And I think it taught me something that we can all learn from. Get to know the heart of people. Yeah. Absolutely. And even when they misspeak, you will you show know. them compassion because you know their heart. There you go. Good closing point there, Ernest. I'm going to tell you, we could go on and on on here, but uh, again, our time is gone. I want to thank you very much for coming on and being our guest today, okay? And I definitely want to have you come back again uh, to just kind of, as we continue to talk about racial trust building, how we can uh, be a part of that here in our community. So thank you once again, Ernest. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned for more three coming up in just a moment.